Beautiful job. Sorry about that. <laughs> Send this back just a little bit. As we uh, begin today's program, in honor of your friend, I want to first thank uh, Kanara Taiko for opening our memorial presentation with uh, John Mori and Danny Yamamoto, whom you may already know from the wonderful uh, jazz group Hiroshima, as well as uh, special guest Maceo Hernandez with the newly formed uh, J-Town Taiko Club. Um, thank you very much to them. I, we can give them a warm round of applause. And also that uh, moving video tribute uh, was thanks to the Mineta Legacy Project team, Diane Fukami, Deborah Nakatomi, Amy Watanabe. They spent 10 faithful years uh, creating the documentary titled Norman Mineta and His Legacy, An American Story. It is a beautiful documentary. And from that, they created the video that you just saw, focusing on the more personal side of our beloved Norman Mineta. So joining us today are Akira Muto, Consul General of Japan in Los Angeles, right over here, uh, U.S. Representatives Ted Liu, Judy Chu, and Jimmy Gomez, California State Assembly Members Mike Fong and Al uh, Muratsuchi, and L.A. County Supervisor Hilda Salus. So it's only fitting that we are here today at the Japanese American National Museum because this place was so um, important to Secretary Medada. To understand who he was, you first have to understand this community and its quiet dignity. And I'm talking about all of you who work so hard, sacrifices in your blood, you forge ahead, you persevere, you do not retreat. You fight for what is right, but you do it quietly. You speak nothing of your toughest battles or your great accomplishments, as we have seen in the past, not even to your own families. As a result, your determination and resulting success is a well-kept secret. And if you are part of this community, you understand what I'm saying. And if you know that, then you understand who Norman Mineta is, our greatest representative. What I hold close to my heart when I think of him is his warmth. It's the first thing I noticed when I met him years ago. It's the last thing I noticed before we said goodbye unknowingly for a final time. And I want you to think about how this man, because of his greatness, carried the burden. He wouldn't use that, bur that word, but he would carry the burden of being the voice of this community for decades. He was our man up front. He had the immense responsibility on his shoulders almost his entire life, yet he did it effortlessly. In fact, he did it with joy. Leadership can be defined and accomplished in different ways. You can be loud and intimidating. And you can also do it quietly with love. And he was certainly the latter. And what a perfect fit for who we are. He taught me, in fact, he, he taught all of us a lot. He described what it was like to be that 10-year-old boy named Norman who loved baseball. Yet, on his way to Hard Mountain, the guards took a small baseball bat from him, a little boy's prized possession, never to be seen again, because it was deemed a weapon in the hands of an enemy alien. It was Secretary Mineta who taught President Bush and the rest of this country how truly devastating stereotyping can be as a TSA was being formed after 9-11. It was Mayor Mineta who taught us that we can rise to the top. We can, because he did. And as he became the first Asian American to become mayor of a major U.S. city, that sent a message to everybody else. And it was Representative Mineta who wiped away a tear as he fearlessly stood before Congress and the entire country and described the indignity of what people of Japanese descent endured during World War II as their civil rights were violated. And it was the legendary 
Norman Mineta, who sat down with me during an interview and proudly cried as he recited an unprecedented apology from the United States government to this great community. And he savored these words. On behalf of the American people, Congress apologizes to those of Japanese ancestry for the gross violation of their constitutional rights. It's clear. Love was always his fuel for his unwavering commitment to fight for what was right. Love for each one of us. And we all felt that. So wherever he is, I hope that he is happy and his beautiful accomplishments give him wings that lift him up as he lifted us up so many times. So as we continue on with this program, for Norman Mineta, the Boy Scouts were such a, a formative part of his childhood, especially in camp. He often talked of his scouting experience with such joy, and it's also how he met Senator Alan Simpson in a pup tent at Heart Mountain as they would become lifelong friends. So today, for the presentation of colors, we invited the honor guards from Little Tokyo's Troop 379, but also a very special honor guard of Boy Scouts at Heart Mountain during the incarceration. They are still young at heart. So we would like to welcome Takashi Hoshizaki, Assistant Scoutmaster for Troop 313 at Heart Mountain. Our Albert Kaimi, Richard Kashino, George Iseri, Hal Kaimi, Bacon Sakatami, and Nori Uyamatsu. So ladies and gentlemen, for the presentation of colors, please rise. Our thanks to Troops 379 and 313 from Heart Mountain. Ladies and gentlemen, you may now be seated. So, it's important in moments like this to have spiritual leadership to help us grieve, but also to help us celebrate a beautiful life. So we begin with a Methodist reflection and invocation. A dear friend of this community, please welcome the Reverend Mark Nakagawa. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I am both humbled and honored to offer this first of two invocations of this morning. Uh, but I'd like to first preface it with a few brief remarks. There are those who believe that religion and politics shouldn't mix. In Norman Minetta's life, nothing could have been further from the truth 
for it was religion that opened the door to his outstanding political career and life as a public servant. The Mineta family are generational pillars of Wesley United Methodist Church in San Jose's Japantown. Norm grew up uh, in the church as a child and later on in life would become one of the adult leaders of the congregation. His involvement in the church, combined with running the family insurance business, which, by the way, started out in the living room of the Mineta House, which was across the street uh, from the church, uh, led to him becoming the treasurer of the Santa Clara County Council of Churches in the mid-1960s. Uh, it was during that time that a seat on the city council opened up and Norm was appointed to that seat. Uh, the rest, as they say, is history. Throughout his many years of travel between San Jose and Washington, D.C., and points in between, Norm always maintained his connections to the Wesley congregation, never forgetting his church roots, and always thankful for the start that the church gave him. As I offer this invocation now from the Christian tradition, I invite you to join with me from whatever religious tradition uh, you represent. Let us pray. Eternal God, we praise you for the great company of all those who have finished their course in faith and now rest from their labor. Especially we praise you for the life of Norman Yoshio Mineta, whom you have graciously received into your presence. To all of these, grant your peace, let perpetual light shine upon them, and help us so to believe what we have not seen, that your presence may lead us through our years and bring us at last with them into the joy of your home, not made with hands, but eternal in the heavens, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Reverend Mark, thank you so much. To lead us through a Buddhist reflection and invocation, please welcome the enlightening and calming presence of Reverend Noriaki Ito. I was going to use the uh, what do we call it? Teleprompter, but I've never used it before and it's really hard to read, so <laughs> I'm glad I brought my notes. Uh, as we gather for this celebration of life in honor of the late Secretary Norman Yoshio Mineta, I'm sure that all of us realize how much each one of us benefited by the many contributions that he made to our community, to our nation, and most likely for people around the world as well. His Japanese name was Yoshio, and the most common way of writing that name in kanji is good person. We can all agree that he wonderfully fulfilled the wishes of his parents, and perhaps his grandparents as well, who gave him that name. The celebrated playwright, George Bernard Shaw, once wrote, I am of the opinion that my life belongs to the whole community, and as long as I live, it is my privilege to do for it what I can. I want to be thoroughly used up when I die, for the harder I work, the more I live. I rejoice in life for its own sake. Life is no brief candle for me. It is a sort of a splendid torch which I have got hold of for a moment, and I want to make it burn as brightly as possible before handing it on to the future generations. I believe that for 90 years, Norm Mineta lived that life. My friends among the Christian clergy have said that they admire the Buddhist tradition of absor observing memorial services after a loved one passes away. We also regard those who pass before us as our personal Buddhas, not in any mystical or even in a religious way. It is taking the definition of a Buddha as a teacher a guide for our everyday lives. We will, be, we will continue to remember the person that he was and the ways in which he made this world a better place to live in. Most of us can only emulate maybe one of the many qualities that he possessed, 
but we can be inspired to do what we can, and perhaps more, more importantly, to share his story with the next generations to come. In this way, his wonderful life of service will continue to be an important part of our legacy for decades to come. Thank you. Bishop Ito, thank you so much. Our next speaker is a man who uh, immersed himself in this community at a time of great challenge, and he found a way to achieve enormous success. Japanese Consul General Akira Moto began his post in Los Angeles just as COVID shut everything down, and yet he still found a way to build friendships and foster meaningful relationships uh, between this country and Japan at one of the highest levels that we have ever seen. So deepening this relationship between our two countries is something that Secretary Mineta felt was vitally important, and he has continued on with that goal. So ladies and gentlemen, Consul General Akira Muto. Good morning. Uh, it is, I am very honored today uh, to be invited to the Secretary Minister's uh, memorial service today and to be asked to uh, provide some words. I'd like to begin by extending my heartfelt sympathies to the family members, friends, and supporters of Secretary Norma Mineta. I was deeply saddened when I received the new news of his passing. A legend in the Japanese-American community, also highly respected in Japan, he was steadfastly dedicated to enhancing U.S.-Japan relations during his long and distinguished life. Secretary Mineta had such a strong impact on U.S.-Japan relations as he made a personal commitment as an elected leader of a high caliber, rising to the highest levels of the U.S. government and prominence in American society. He greatly advanced the stature of the Japanese Americans in the United States and by extension helped strengthen the trust of Americans in Japan. It is remarkable that after being such bitter enemies during World War II, Japan and the United States now have one of the strongest alliances in the world. Naturally, it took huge efforts on both sides to overcome the past. The great wound the Empire of Japan's actions during World War II inflicted on the relationship between Japan and the United States and Japan and Japanese Americans could not have been repaired during the post-war era without the work of leaders such as Secretary Mineta. Secretary was one of those Japanese Americans who was deeply concerned about the neglect by Japanese of the relationship with Japanese Americans in the past many years and did not hesitate to point that out to enlighten me that it takes deliberate and ongoing efforts to keep these relationships in good shape. That is how I came to work together on nurturing the exchange of younger generation Japanese Americans and Japanese as we look for, towards the empowerment, empowerment of future leaders. For all of his achievements in advancing the bilateral relationship, Secretary Mineta received the Grand Cordon Order of Rising Sun from the Government of Japan in 2007. The last time I spoke with Secretary Mineta was several months ago online. I promised him that when he traveled to LA next time, I would host him at my residence and serve Unagi from his home prefecture of Shizuoka. It is my regret that I cannot serve his favorite Unagi to Secretary Mineta anymore. But hold the precious memory of this last conversation we had, he was a great friend of Japan, and he will be greatly missed. May no man rest in peace. It is now our responsibility to carry on his legacy. 
Thank you. Council General, thank you so much. To, to survive in politics is challenging enough, but to thrive takes a special person with a determined, resilient spirit. Our next speaker can relate to Secretary Mineta in many ways. He is an Asian American congressman who continues to fight the battles that Mineta waged years ago. In addition to that, he, like Mineta, served in the military. He was active duty in the Air Force and then the Air Force Reserve and just retired two years ago at the rank of Colonel. Ladies and gentlemen, representing the 33rd District in Los Angeles, please welcome U.S. Congressman Ted Lieu. Good morning. Thank you, David, for that introduction, for being MC. Thank you for all of you for being here. My wife Betty and I brought our two children, Brennan and Austin, because we wanted them to learn more about an American legend. Secretary Mineta's life embodies both the promise and the complexities of America. He went from being interned at Heart Mountain during World War II to receiving the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2006, all in one generation. And in between, he did enough that he could have lived multiple lifetimes. I had the honor of meeting Secretary Mineta when I was active duty in the Air Force in the 1990s, and we were at a federal Asian Pacific American Council Leadership Award Center. And to me, Secretary Mineta was larger than life. But when I met him, he was so kind and warm and gracious. And we had the opportunity to see each other at various political and governmental events. I had the honor of getting to know his son, David, even more. And it was just an honor for me uh, to have known Secretary Mineta. As all of you know, he also had a great sense of humor. And David Ono mentioned how Secretary Mineta had his bat taken away when he showed up at internment camp. Well, many years later, when Congressman Mineta uh, was serving in Congress, he received a bat that was once owned by Hank Aaron. That bat was valued at $1,500, which was over the congressional gift limit. <laughs> to which Secretary Mineta replied, the damn government's taken my bat again. <laughs> now, despite being intern, Secretary Mineta never held any bitterness. In fact, quite the opposite. He joined the United States Army and served as an intelligence officer because he believed in the promise of America. And then in 1967, he served on the San Jose City Council. In 1971, he ran for mayor against 14 other candidates, and he got over 60% of the vote, a remarkable accomplishment I've never seen duplicated anywhere else with that many candidates running. He did a great job as mayor, and that by itself would have been a life well lived. But his trailblazing continued. He then went on and served in Congress, winning in 1974. He served for two decades, and he co-founded the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, which is currently chaired by our amazing Congresswoman Judy Chu. He also chaired their powerful Transportation Infrastructure Committee, and as all of you know, he was a driving force of the Civil Liberties Act of 1988 that apologized and gave redress for the Japanese American internment. His service in Congress by itself would have been a life well lived, but his trailblazing continued. In 1995, he went to the private sector, but our government called him back. And in 2000, President Bill Clinton nominated Secretary Mineta as the first Asian American cabinet member where he was Secretary of Commerce. And then in 2001, President George W. Bush nominated Secretary Mineta to the Transportation Secretary position where he was only a fourth person in U.S. history to serve under two different presidents of two different parties. And Secretary Mineta was the right person for the job in the wake of the horrific 9-11 attacks. Secretary Mineta understood the great pressures that there would be on our country to engage in racial discrimination because he experienced it 
when he was interned and throughout his life. And he stood firm and said, we will not engage in racial profiling, that he will absolutely not engage in any racial screenings. And he directed the airlines to not discriminate against any passenger based on race, national origin, or religion. And he was right. And to the family of Norma Manetta, to Denny and David and Stuart, and to your families, I want to say thank you for sharing Norma Manetta with the American people. Our country is a better place to live, work, travel, and play because of Norma Manetta. Thank you, Representative Liu. So our, our next speaker is also courageously continuing on with Mineta's legacy, fighting the good fight in Washington, making a difference. Her visibility alone is vitally important because she is the first ever Chinese American woman elected to Congress. And since getting there in 2009, she has amassed a long list of accomplishments, protecting the rights of women, fighting on behalf of Asian Americans and people of color, Knowing that she, like Mineta, is a role model for a whole new generation of diverse people to come. Ladies and gentlemen, representing the 27th District in Los Angeles, please welcome U.S. Congresswoman Judy Chu. Good morning. It's my honor to join you today to say a few words about Secretary Norman Y. Mineta, a trailblazing Asian American pioneer, political giant, and my dear friend. It's hard to comprehend the enormity of Norm's contributions to America. I'd like to talk, though, about what Norm did to transform Asian American Pacific Islanders in Washington, D.C., and therefore the nation from invisibility to positions of power and influence. He did this in so many ways. First, by founding our Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, which we call KPAC. Norm served 10 terms in Congress, and he often told me the story of how early on as a Congress member, he asked the White House to set up a meeting with him and his fellow AAPI members but they stopped him by asking, what group are you with? Well, Asian American members of Congress didn't have any official group, so he realized he just had to form one. So that's how he founded KPAC. He became KPAC's first chair, and after that, they did start getting the meetings they wanted, including with the White House. I now have the privilege of serving as KPAC's current chair, I'm joined by fellow KPAC member, Congress member Ted Liu, and I'm so proud to tell you that since its founding and Norm's continual guidance, KPAC has grown in power and influence. Today we have 21 AAPI members of Congress, our highest number in history. And with our associate members, we have a total of 76 members of Congress belonging to KPAC. Because of this, we have been able to pass historic legislation recently with our COVID-19 hate crimes bill and the AAPI Smithsonian Museum Study Bill. But this wouldn't have happened without Norm's vision. Then, immediately after starting KPAC, Norm could see that there had to be a way of getting more AAPI young people to go into public service, of building the AAPI public service pipeline in Washington, D.C. and throughout the nation. So he founded the Asian Pacific American Institute for Congressional Studies. Today, this organization is playing such a critical role in cultivating future AAPI leaders with internships and fellowships who've gone on to remarkable positions, including within the White House, Capitol Hill, and even our own executive director of KPAC. 
It is thanks to Norm that we have the critical infrastructure ensuring our future AAPI national leaders. Now you've heard Norm made history by becoming the first Asian American ever appointed to a presidential cabinet when President Clinton selected him to be Secretary of Commerce. He was then appointed by President Bush to be Secretary of Transportation during a critical period of the department's response during the 9-11 terrorist attacks. It was so remarkable that he was a cabinet secretary for not one, but two presidents, both Democrat and Republican. Now, today we know that we have to combat anti-Asian hate. We've especially been doing it these last two and a half years. And we need to do it by promoting our community's histories and the contributions of our role models. And that is why it's so significant that hundreds of thousands of people every day fly in and out of the Norman Y. Mineta San Jose International Airport. And just this year, we renamed the Department of Transportation Headquarters building in Washington, D.C. after Norm as well. Now, despite the fact that he walked with presidents, Norm was such a kind, humble, and gracious man. He was a mentor for so many Congress members, including myself, and so many others in the AAPI community. In fact, Congress member Mark Takano really wanted to be here, but he got COVID. So he asked me to tell this story to all of you. He remembers a critical moment in 1984 when he was running for Congress, and he was outed as gay by his hometown newspaper. It was a crisis point for Mark. Norm not only called him that day to show his support, but he took it upon himself to call the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee to make sure that Mark would still be considered a top race. Mark was so touched that Norm would not only support him as a fully gay Japanese American, but was proactive in defending him. He also appreciated the fact that Norm always straightened his tie and fixed his collar so he would look presentable. <laughs> That's the kind of person Norm was. Well, no wonder Norm is considered the godfather of the AAPI community. No matter how busy or how high his position, he always prioritized opening doors for future leaders and even students and interns. He showed us how much we could achieve and pulled us up with him. I truly believe that while he may be gone in body, his legacy lives on in all of us. We owe such a debt of gratitude for all that Norm did to uplift and empower us. So to Denny, Dave, Stewart, and the entire Mineta family, thank you for sharing Norm with all of us. You've welcomed the AAPI community into your family, and you are forever a part of ours. Thank you, Norm, for all that you've done, and may you rest in peace. And now I'd like to present a congressional certificate for Norm to Denny and Congress member Ted Liu, and I will present it together.
Representatives Chu and Lou, thank you so much. So we, and you've heard it many times already this morning, we are so proud of the fact that Secretary Mineta was not only the first ever Asian American to serve on a cabinet, but he did it for two presidents in two different parties. Well, our next speaker has broken new ground in this area as well, being the first Latina ever to serve on a president's cabinet. Not only that, she is the daughter of immigrants. She has a lot in common with our gathering today. And she continues to serve our local communities. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome LA County Supervisor Hilda Solis. Buenos dias. Hello and good afternoon to everyone. I'm Hilda Solis representing the County Board of Supervisors First District, which happens to represent the largest AAPI community in Los Angeles County. And I wear that uh, with dignity and respect. But today I'm proud and honored to be here with you to celebrate the life of the Honorable Norm Panetta. It's truly a wonderful occasion for us to celebrate his life and to hear all these wonderful stories about him and how he gave so selflessly to so many people and will continue to do that. I had the pleasure of knowing Secretary Mineta when I was in the State Senate serving in Sacramento back in the mid-90s. And then again when I got elected to Congress back in 2000 to 2009, and we worked on many issues. He was one of those saviors that actually helped us get things done in an administration that may not have been too friendly to people like me, but he made it happen. And he was such a, a voice of reason, but always friendship and kindness. And he fought for what he believed in, and I knew that well of him. Uh, we thank President Clinton for appointing him in such a prestigious position, and also serving under then President Bush. I also want to mention that I became friends with him because of a group of individuals that would, I don't want to say hang out, but we would commiserate. And those people were very good, dear friends of mine, because when I got to the Congress, I sometimes felt alone and um, couldn't always relate to everybody there but knew where I was grounded with people that had the same values I had and understood the West Coast, because we would always get criticized for representing California. But I found an affinity with people that I met in Congress. And of course, Mineta, Mr. Uh, or Secretary, was one of those individuals. But I got to meet other people that he also uh, brought around and were lovely individuals to serve with, Bob Matsui, and his wife, Doris Matsui, who curr currently serves in Congress, as well as our dear friend, Mike Conda, and Patsy Mink, Patsy Mink. These are all trailblazers in the AAPI Japanese American community. And I can't tell you how proud I am to have known him, Norm, but also the others that also have a legacy. But working as a very powerful voice in Washington meant a lot to be able to look to them, to look to him as a leader, a trailblazer. He was a champion to, for people to advocate for transparency in government and accountability. And I think those are the principles that many of us desire to have, and we need to continue to impart that upon our other elected officials. I too hold those principles firmly in my belief in what I'm doing now on the County Board of Supervisors as well as the Metro outgoing chair of the Metro Board. Secretary Mineta broke the color lines and advocated not only for Asian Americans or for his own hometown in San Jose, but for all of us, for people of color, for women, for people that didn't have a voice, that were vulnerable. That's what he represents to many of us. And at this special moment, I know that it is important to have leaders like that to stand up for us and he taught us how to do that. It's because of trailblazers like Secretary Mineta that our government is more diverse at all levels, local and nationally, so that our government reflects all the people everywhere, regardless of where you are, where you live, what zip code, what religion, and who you love. When we look back at his life, the countless 
significant accomplishments for which we all benefit, the one accomplishment that I think the most poignant, especially as we convene here today at the Japanese American National Museum, is his sponsorship of the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, which gave redress to the living survivors of 120,000 Japanese descendants who were removed from their homes during World War II and placed in an American internment camps. The most important part of the act was a long overdue apology from the federal government. That's why I authored a motion this week as chair of the board of Los Angeles County Metropolitan Transportation Authority, known as Metro, and co-authored by Mayor Eric Garcetti to dedicate the Little Tokyo Arts District Station in honor of Secretary Mineta. <laughs> For his service to this country and especially to the Nikkei community. So with that, I thank you for allowing me to have the privilege to join you and the family to celebrate Secretary Normanetta. And I have special best wishes to his wife, Denny, to the entire family, and thank you again for giving me this privilege. I too have a scroll that I'd like to present to you on behalf of the County Board of Supervisors. Thank you very much. Supervisor Solis, thank you so much. So it's easy to lose sight of the enormity of Norman Mineta's accomplishments. We often focus on one or two highlights without grasping the bigger picture. There's his legacy in politics, his legacy in social justice, and the hard work he has done for this very institution, the Japanese American National Museum. So I would like to direct your attention to the video monitors for a special tribute with rare footage of Secretary Mineta shot over many years as we celebrate his incredible life. This is the barracks from Heart Mountain where, where I lived. <clears throat> I don't recognize this barracks. 24-7B, Block 24, Barracks 7, Unit B. You know, I met Alan Simpson here as a Boy Scout in 1943. And I was thinking, Alan, we're back under a tent again. <laughs> oh, ours was a lot smaller. And I could always say that I first met Alan when he had hair. And he was roly-poly. When my bat was confiscated, and we got to Santa Anita, and, you know, we still wanted to play baseball. And I remember we found a stick, which was about the size of a bat. But if you've ever tried striking a ball with just a plain stick, man, it stings. And I remember swinging and hitting the ball, and you just immediately let go of the bat, and it just stung. 1991, and a person wrote to me saying, uh, and I was very touched by the fact that you uh, lost your bat when you were getting on the train that day, but I would like to share a bat with you from my own collection. So I opened up this box, baseball bat, signed by Hank Aaron. Mm -hmm home run king of the United States. Satahauru, oh, 
home run king of Japan. One bat, two signatures. And I write this fellow, thank you very much for this great gift. And so then a reporter from the San Jose Mercury News found out the bat was worth $1,500. Well, under congressional law, I couldn't accept anything <laughs> in excess of $250 in value. So I had to write him a letter, thank you very much for this gift, but under congressional law, I cannot accept a gift. I also sent a copy of that letter to the reporter, and I put in the corner of that letter, the damn government's taken my bat again. <laughs> What do we do with all the stories of those of us of Japanese ancestry and the things we experienced during one of the most traumatic periods in our nation's history? It is a part of the American story to which we have been given custody. Even though we didn't want it and certainly didn't ask for it, but it is now it will always be our job to make sure that the lessons of the past are never forgotten. And as very proud members of the American family, we have a standard of honor to live up to. And every single one of us knows who set that standard. Japanese American National Museum stands as a testament and a reminder of all the things we have experienced. We have one photographer in the gray. Once he takes his shot, everybody can take their shot. Ben's taking it. Ben's taking it. Gray hat. Hey, Ben, we're over here. <laughs> Tell us when you're shooting, Ben. I've been very fortunate to be in places that I could never have imagined as a little kid. I stood on the shoulders of giants who preceded us and allowed us to be able to do the things that we are doing today. And from the perspective of someone who watched the apricot orchards I grew up among, turn into Silicon Valley, I can tell you that my faith in crystal balls falls farther and farther with each new vision. It's less predictable, but it is more rewarding than anything that could be planned. As my father always told me, always bring everything you are to everything you do. And one of the most important parts of who I am always have been and always will be is this community and all of you. And by the way, uh, the baseball bat story, the gentleman who, who sent Norman Mineta the baseball bat signed by Hank Aaron, his name is Norm Emerson, uh, and he's here with us today. Norm, can you stand up? There we go. One of his many, many wonderful stories. Well, next is a, a musical tribute of a favorite song of Norman and his wonderful wife, Denny. It's a song from the 60s that we have heard many times, but this time I'd like you to really listen to the lyrics uh, with lines like, to fight the unbeatable foe, to right the unrightable wrong. This is my quest, no matter how hopeless, no matter how far. In a song, this is Norman Mineta, performed by Michael Morata and Helen Ota of the Grateful Crane Ensemble. Ladies and gentlemen, The Impossible Dream.
to dream the impossible dream to fight the unbeatable foe to bear with unbearable sorrow to run where the brave dare not go Beautiful job, Helen and Michael. So our next speaker is a, a dear friend of mine and one of a new generation of heroes for this community. Shirley Huguchi's parents met as children at Heart Mountain. And through an incredible chain of events, today, thanks to Shirley's tireless efforts and sheer grit, Heart Mountain now has a world-class interpretive center and will soon have the Minetta Simpson Institute. She worked closely with Secretary Mineta for many years, finding a way to hone his energy and his wisdom and turn that into hope for the future. There is no one more devoted to his legacy. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Shirley Higuchi. Oh gosh, what an emotional day. Denny, I'm really sorry. I'm sorry for the whole Minetta family. But mostly I feel sorry for us because we no longer have Norm with us to guide us through some very turbulent times that we're facing now. Norm knew that our country could be at risk for many problems. And I told him the reason why I wanted to work with him to form the Mineta Simpson Institute was because I wanted to harness his wisdom, his strength, his ability to build bridges and bring people together. And I'm so lucky to be here at the Japanese American National Museum. I'm so lucky to see the original Boy Scouts from Heart Mountain here today. And I have to mention Takashi Hoshizaki, who I believe is the oldest Boy Scout here today, unless I'm mistaken, who's also on my board of directors, has been a steadfast supporter of what Norm believed in, which is building something of significance at the place 
where over 10,000 Japanese Americans were incarcerated along with Norm. The history of Senator Al Simpson in Norm's life was formed behind barbed wire. They were only children, along with many other children that were incarcerated. But Norm never allowed his incarceration experience to define him. But he also didn't shy away from saying, I had my rights taken away from me and I'll make sure it never happens again to anyone. And of course, you know, all the times that we've had together, remember 2011 opening the museum, Norm was there, Al was there, Senator Inouye was there along with Irene. There was so much joy in Norm's eyes. And before I, he passed away, I gave him some great news. I said, you know what, we're halfway there now with the Manetta Simpson Institute. And he always loved it when I called him up and gave him great news. And he kept on pushing me, you know, maybe we should call it the Simpson Manetta, because he's always putting everyone first. And I said, no, 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 trust me. Al really wants it to be the Manetta Simpson Institute, but he wouldn't stop hounding me on switching the names around. And I said, we can't call it the Simpson Minetti Institute because then we'd be known as the s and Institute. <laughs> and, and then they would wonder, like, what we're doing at Heart Mountain, right? <laughs> After I made that comment to him, he never bothered to ask again, so. <laughs> but in any event, Norm always had a plan. The problem I had is I never knew what it, it was always exactly, but I think he had plans for me. I think he had plans for Ann Burroughs. Of course, we never knew what those plans were until now. And I almost wish I could pull Norm aside and say, Norm, I get you. I got it now. I know what you really wanted. You wanted us to get along. You wanted us to work together. And I never believed since 2011 that I would be standing here in your Janum home welcoming me. So I thank the Jana board, I thank Ann Burroughs, but most of all, I thank this community. Thank you for having me. That was beautiful, Shirley. Um, if you have spent any time at all with Norman Mineta, then, then you know his laugh. It comes from deep inside of him and it reveals the true sense of joy he has inside of his heart. So our next speaker is a dear friend who knows that laugh better than anyone. From the minute they met in DC decades ago, they were kindred spirits, both Japanese American, both highly successful, both devoted to being good people and supporting each other. Ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker is the president and CEO of HH Trans PAC, Inc., but more importantly, he is one of Norin Mineta's closest friends, Mr. Hideki Hamamoto. Okay. Thank you, David, for that kind introduction. And good morning to all Mineta fans. I'd like to thank uh, Ambrose and the Japanese American National Museum for this opportunity to share my personal remembrances about the Honorable Secretary Norman Yoshio Mineta. But my personal remembrances are about a friend I knew as Norm. I first met Norm in the mid-70s, early in his freshman term in Congress, as he spoke at a JSL function. Afterwards, I nervously introduced myself, and I remember he made it so easy, easy to talk to him, and that was my initial remembrance of Norm, friendly and affable. We continued with uh, periodic contacts that eventually led to family dinners and outings. On one occasion, our families went skiing. Our kids quickly learned to whiz down the slopes. Norm took on the bunny slopes. 
And well, let's just say he was a heck of a lot better at walking the halls of Congress <laughs> than he was skiing on the slope, bunny slopes. But that was Norm. He gave it his all, no matter what the challenge. Norm and family hosted family New Year parties for families, emphasis on family, with fun and laughter taking center stage. After one such party, we faced icy roads going home, nothing more terrorizing to a transplanted Southern Californian like me. So Norm and family talked us into staying overnight. That was Norm reaching out and lending a friendly hand without hesitation. And we accepted without reservation. A heartwarming outcome of this family relationship is that Norm's sons and my daughters have become like brothers and sisters over the years. They trust each other, rely on each other, and lately have leaned on each other. Norv gained time to his community in many ways, such as attending local picnics where you would have a hand in grilling and eating chicken teriyaki and hamburgers. On such occasion, I often greeted Norm with, Sensei, how in the heck are you? Or, Sensei, genki desu ka? And we would have a good hearty laugh as we shook hands. A memorable occasion was Norm hosting a JCL leadership group. He returned late from his office, clearly exhausted from a long congressional session, but he loosened his tie, rolled up his sleeves, and made it a point to first talk to each one individually before discussing the working of Congress. Throughout, he was encouraging them to be active, reach out, and speak up. This was Sensei nurturing our youth. This was Norm going back, giving back to his community. Those are some of my remembrances from my early years with Norm. The latter years began around 2003 when I returned from an eight-year assignment in Tokyo. By then, Norm had moved from Virginia to a beautiful home in Edgewater, Maryland, fronting the expansive Chesapeake Bay. A poignant remember remembrance is when we were chatting in his living room. I asked, what was one of the highlights or exciting moments of his career? He mused a bit and said that probably the grounding of all aircraft during 9-11. But a little bit later, unsolicited, he said, you know, I miss the days when we used to have teriyaki chicken at the local picnic, the fun-filled New Year's family gatherings, the impromptu and informal dinner outings. In my mind, Secretary Mineta remembered 9-11, but it was Norm longing and recalling the good old days. During COVID, we checked on each other through text, and you could tell he missed soul food. So later, we occasionally took over bento boxes, sushi platters, and sukiyaki, and had outdoor lunches at his home. The last time we saw Norm was when he called to go to our favorite Japanese restaurant in Virginia, and he insisted it was his treat and guess what, he ordered sukiyaki. <laughs> Norm just savored his soul food. But it was shortly after that, we learned through family texts that Norm had been hospitalized, taken a turn for the worse, and passed peacefully on May 3rd. He was at home with his family at his side, overlooking the serenely beautiful Chesapeake Bay. And so we say thank you, Norm, for climbing the steepest mountain for redress,
for your leadership and courage during 9-11, for giving back to our community in so many ways, for giving your all, whether in the halls of Congress or on the bunny slopes. Norm, I will celebrate your life and friendship forever in my mind as well as my heart. I thank you for embracing us all. Rest well, my friend. My sensei, everybody's sensei. Beautiful speech, Mr. Hamamoto. Thank you so much. Well, I often say that one of the most inspiring people that I have ever met is our next speaker. There's no one more in tune with what it's like to fight, and I mean fight, for social justice. Growing up in South Africa, she fought against apartheid and was actually arrested and imprisoned. Many arrested were executed, but Anne Burroughs was among the lucky and she continues her fight worldwide. And that's why we are so fortunate to have her land at our doorstep. The former chair of Amnesty International Global Assembly and Amnesty International USA, she is now the president and CEO of this great place, the Japanese American National Museum, and was a dear friend of Norman Mineta. Ladies and gentlemen, Ann Burroughs. Denny, David, Stuart, members of Norm's beloved family, and all of you here today are honored guests. Today, we celebrate a giant in every respect. Norm was larger than life, with the biggest heart, the greatest vision, and an expansive legacy that touches everyone and everything here today. I feel Norm's presence here in the museum, this museum that he loved, this museum that he helped to build more than 30 years ago, which he transformed through his leadership as our beloved chair of our board of trustees. I feel him in this community, which he helped stitch together with his devotion, and in the fabric of this country, which he changed for the better with his service and clear-eyed patriotism. Few, I think, few understood better than Norm just how imperfect America is. Few had greater conviction that this union could be more perfect, and few worked harder to make it so. Norm's improbable journey to Washington by way of San Jose and a tar paper barrack at Heart Mountain is testament to the strength of his character. That 11-year-old Cub Scout robbed of his little league bat, taken from his boyhood home, forcibly removed from his boyhood home, and labeled an enemy child by his own country, could have taken a very different path. He could have turned away from the call to service instead of turning towards it. But that just, but that just wasn't who Norm was. He understood with such clarity the power of choices, the ones we don't make and the ones we do make. In 2017, when I first came to Janum, I worked with Norm to bring Executive Order 9066 to the museum on the 75th anniversary of its signing. And I will never forget that moment, that humbling experience of witnessing Norm confront that original document for the first time. It was incredibly emotional and poignant for him to see President Roosevelt's signature there on that page, the unassuming and banal pen strokes that upended his and his family's lives and those of 120,000 others. A culmination of the choices by people in power to put their prejudice ahead of his civil rights. Norm didn't get to choose the path of his childhood 
but it informed every single choice he made after that. The choice to pursue, to pursue positions of great responsibility. And importantly, the choices he made once he got there. At every opportunity, he chose the path of service, first in the military, then representing his community on San Jose City Council as its mayor and later in Congress, and then as a cabinet secretary to two presidents. As Norm rose in politics, he chose the path his father advised, reminding him to always bring everything you are to everything you do. And Norm did, he always did just that. Whether as a champion of transportation policy and infrastructure, a co-founder of the Asian Pacific American Caucus, or famously, a driving force behind the movement for reparations, um, for redress, which was an uphill battle and a painful reckoning. But Norm never once wavered in his faith and determination to see redress enacted. He understood the power of his personal story, the power of that story, and he recognized his unique role as an ambassador. He was relentless, not only in pursuing justice for Japanese Americans, in pursuing justice for his community, but in challenging his country to live up to its highest ideals, pushing for an unprecedented admission of wrong, wrongdoing and an unequivocal stake in the ground, never again. And that was one of the reasons why he loved Janum so much, because Janum stands as a beacon of never again. And for him, Janum was a jewel, and Janum was a gift to the nation because of that never again. Norm's fight for redress, we know it looked backwards and it looked forwards, reflecting another choice that guided his life, to draw from his experiences a more universal charge to dedicate himself to fighting discrimination and injustice everywhere, to tell the Japanese story, his story, in a way that both honors history and safeguards the future. That's exactly what he did on September 11, 2001, acting quickly to ground traffic and later to create the TSA, which protects us to this day. And when national panic spurred calls for racial profiling of Arab and Muslim communities, Norm served as a living testament, as a living reminder of that history that America must never repeat. To this day, I am so struck by the enormity of that moment when President Bush looked around the room and told his cabinet, we don't want to have happened today what happened to Norm in 1942. Although Norm was always quick to give credit elsewhere and to downplay his own profound impact, history will always remember the choices he made that day not just in defense of his country's safety, but also in defense of its soul. We're profoundly fortunate to have had that extraordinary man as our leader at Janum. We are so fortunate to have had his courageous leadership. Where Norm was always guided by the same unshakable internal compass, directing his focus on the lessons of history and their relevance today and their urgency today. It's a focus that united Norm and me from the very beginning when I shared with him my own history and my own background as an anti-apartheid activist and as, and as a political prisoner in my native South Africa. And we talked about how that too, for me, fuels my commitment to fight for human rights and to defend civil liberties to this day. From my first meeting with Norm, I felt an immediate connection with this kind, brilliant, dignified, charismatic man who sat across the table from me. I'm sorry. I knew at once that Norm was going to be extraordinarily important in my life. 
but I could never have predicted the years to come. The special friendship we develop, full of both momentous and irreverent stories. And we all have Norm stories, those wonderful, wonderful stories. And then there was the laughter, always the laughter, and the taking the mickey out of each other, every single opportunity that we had. And I grew to recognize that twinkle in his eye and that wicked expression on his face, and I knew that there was going to be a zinger directed at me, and I knew that I wouldn't be quick enough to catch it before it came. And then, of course, there were the quiet conversations that we'd share. Each one a masterclass in decency, humanity, selfless leadership, and vision. The, pre the precious gift of friendship and time with Norm. We all hold that. And the way I'd be welcomed into his family and into his home, which was always so full of love and always so full of laughter and the joyful connection I'd make with Denny, and the joyful friendship that we would develop, and the wonderful opportunity of getting to know their sons, David, Stuart, Mark, and Bob. I'm filled with gratitude for this man. I'm filled with gratitude for the partnership we shared. It was my privilege, thank you, it was my privilege to work with Norm as we charted a bold course for Janum, as he spoke out against threats to civil liberties, attacks against the Constitution, discrimination and prejudice in all its forms, anti-Asian hate. He was always, always unafraid to take a stand. As Norm said to me more than once when we were criticized for the direction that Janum was going in, he would always say to me, it may not be the comfortable thing to do, but it's the right thing to do. And we must always do the right thing. And for him, the choice was clear. I've had in my life the opportunity to work with some great leaders. I think particularly the heroes, my heroes, of the South African liberation struggle. I've had the honor of working with President Mandela, with Archbishop Tutu with Ahmed Kathrada, with Walter Sisulu. And I can say to you in all sincerity that Norm sits right up there. He is in the pantheon of the greats. Norm has left us with only one choice. His inspiring leadership and his incredible service call us to act, to take up the work that is never complete. In remembrance of a great man, a hero, who did everything in his power to build a more just and equal world for all of us. Norm, I thank you. And I promise you that we will celebrate you and we will honor you well. Thank you. And thank you so much. That was beautiful. So we have uh, talked about Norman Mineta, the great leader. But let's talk about Mr. Mineta, the devoted father and family man. Imagine what it must have been like to sit on the front lines as your own father creates history. How does he even describe to his family the enormity of what he is doing? And what was it like behind the scenes privately while living such a public life. Ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker, please welcome Norman Mineta's son, Stuart. Thank you. Thank you, David, for that introduction. And thank you to the Japanese American National Museum for putting on this wonderful celebration of life for dad. Thank you, Ann, for all your hard work. On behalf of Denny, my brother David, who's here, and our uh, two brothers, 
Mark and Bob who were unable to make it. We thank all of you for joining us on this day of celebration for Dad. As you can imagine, I mean, this last month and a half has been a bit difficult for us. We all really miss him so much. But his story, his life, uh, isn't much different than many of you here. Those are the Boy Scout from the troop at Heart Mountain. But that unique Japanese-American story of internment is something that, quite honestly, mom and dad never told us when we were kids. And I've heard this from many, a lot of my friends. So in the 80s when redress was coming up, you know, we hear that dad's going to uh, the commission hearings and giving testimony and we're like, what, 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 what's the story about camp? And only to find out that it was gonna be one of the most egregious civil liberties injustices of our time. Well, back then, Dad was pretty busy uh, while, while he was in Congress. Um, and we didn't really get to see him that much. Uh, but when we did get to see him, his time was very focused on us as kids. I talked about uh, growing up two stories that reminded me of, uh, of all the stories that we were hearing, the reflections, recollections that people had that they were writing into the Mineta Legacy Project uh, uh, website or s various social media postings uh, that were forwarded to us or just cards that were being sent uh, to the family, just relaying about their stories or their interactions they had with dad and it just reminded, re reminded me of, of, of what dad was about. He, he was about those connections with everybody. Being able to connect your personal story to his. To be able to draw the similarities and say, hey, you know, yeah, I, I have a story like this too. And that's what this wonderful museum is all about, collecting those stories. Possibly reliving them, but also learning from them. And not holding them in, being quiet, not letting other people know about it. At the service in San Jose, President Clinton basically gave us a call to arms to say, what are we gonna learn from dad's life? And basically that was it. We have all these stories that we can tell, that we can share, but most importantly that we could learn from and let other communities know that, hey, we have this story, you probably have a story like this too. To help us father, foster relationships and maybe just get along a little bit more. <laughs> David talked about, you know, what it was like growing up at this time during redress and, you know, for us kids and for our, uh, his grandkids, our kids, uh, dad was just dad and he was grandpa. And I think about, you know, in, in our childhood, yes, we were pretty lucky. We got to, to be around people that ended up going on to do great things. <clears throat> 
one of those connections that I, I'm reminded, excuse me, I'm reminded of those connections. I mean, even to this day, I'm, you know, coming up on a plane today with my wife to come here and seated at the airplane, you know, in the, in the seat was your uh, former chair of the board here, Gordon Yamate. And he, he looks up at me and he says, I think I know where you're going. And I look down and I'm like, oh my goodness, Gordon. Well, I guess I, I know where you're going too. You know, those connections are very, very, very strong uh, to me and to Dave. You know, Gordon was, his family was family friends of ours from, from the Bay Area, from San Jose. But he was also an intern in dad's office. 1976, I was six years old. And so he used to take care of me. Took me to a Giants game, even, even after all that. I mean, I remember first meeting him in DC. But those staff members, they all became our families. There's one story, one, some of them taught Dave, gave him some dance lessons before his first dance. <laughs> but dad loved family. He loved that closeness and togetherness that, that family brought, the idea of family. And he extended that idea out to just beyond our family. So when he shared his story with you or he listened to your story, that meant everything to him. Congressman Liu and his wife said, you know, thank you for sharing him. Well, you know, sharing our dad. That's all we knew. That's what our family knew growing up, was that he shared his time with everybody. And that's how we should, should live our lives. And so when President Clinton sort of had this call to arms, what are we gonna learn from, from dad's life? It was, it was to share, to foster this idea of community to where we would all be able to have connections with each other. Getting to know people like the Hamamoto's, same thing, same time frame, early 70s. We've known them for so long and our families are so close. I won't show you some of the somewhat embarrassing stories about me, with the Hamamoto's. But that's how close our families are. And these are those stories that, these connections that dad had with, with a lot of people, with everyone. Those pictures, even the interviews that dad did, it really speaks to the heart of dad. How much he wanted to know everyone's stories, to share them, to connect. He was very generous with his time. He was very polite, very courteous, humble, helpful. He always thought of himself as a servant to others. And some, those are some of the greatest lessons I could have learned from him without having him tell me, this is what you need to do. So we thank you for, for having us here today.
but also for sharing your stories with Dad because we know that made his life that much richer so that he could live that life well lived. Thank you again for having us today. Stuart, thank you so much. By the way, I know it's been a, a really busy day throughout Los Angeles. A lot's been going on, both good and bad. Uh, but I am happy to say, and we're proud to have Mayor Eric Garcetti with us. Uh, <laughs> right when the drum is going by him, but he's standing right over there. And Mayor, it's great to see you. I know you're super busy, and I'm sure Norma Mineta really appreciates your presence here. And as you can see, we're, we're preparing here Again, uh, a, a wonderful tribute continues. Ladies and gentlemen, we want to welcome back Kinara Taiko with a special musical tribute.
Gennaro Tycho, everybody. Thank you so much. Absolutely beautiful. So as we bring this ceremony to a close, I would like to invite back our Boy Scout troops and the Nisei Scouts from Heart Mountain to rejoin us for a special flag presentation. And may I ask Norman's wife, Denny, and two sons, Stuart and David, to, to please stand at your seat so our Nisei Scouts can perform our special presentation. They can take it away. And ladies and gentlemen, may I ask you all to stand for the retiring of the colors. Please be seated. And our thanks to our Boy Scout Troops 379 and 313 from Heart Mountain. It was wonderful having you young men with us today. So as we say goodbye, our sadness can be lifted. May we all live a life so full now, we all have regrets, and I'm sure Norman had his, but they are far outweighed by his steadfast determination to fight for what is right, no matter how impossible, as the song goes. He did reach the unreachable, and now his heart can lie peaceful and calm as he is laid to rest. So may I ask you to please remain seated for just a couple more minutes while our presenters leave the program. But I want to remind everybody that Norman loved to laugh. So if we could continue on with our day and celebrate his life. And, and by the way, since we did miss the naked bike ride next door, uh, that is, it's regrettably too late to join. But we do have a few things for you to participate in this afternoon. Okay, so first of all, we will play the video tribute courtesy of the Mineta Legacy Project team. And their full documentary, which is wonderful, will be screening this afternoon in the Democracy Center right across the breezeway here. And we will have refreshments available for everyone outside of the courtyard, uh, including donations uh, from our friends at Fugetsudo and Sunzo. Brian, thank you. Um, by the way, the museum will be open with free admission today. We'd love for you to come in, look around, have a special place to set up uh, behind the lobby here where you can actually submit your memories about Norman Mineta, and that way the Mineta family can read them a little bit later on. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming and supporting this beautiful ceremony. To Norman Mineta, may we all hold his memory, and more importantly, what he stood for deep in our hearts. Good day. When I think about my own life, I chose very carefully the family that I was born into. Great parents, great sisters, great brother, and I was so fortunate to be a part of that family. December 7th, so to me, 
that sort of has um, played a factor in everything I've done, uh, whether it was going to school in terms of college or military service, whatever. Does our Constitution indeed protect all of us, regardless of race or culture? As an example of trying to work hard, um, I was on the basketball team in high school. I'm five feet six, and I was a guard, not a very good guard. So I thought, I'm going to start exercising and jumping as high as I could. And I'd be in the kitchen and mark wherever I hit the wall and just throw my mother crazy because these pencil marks going up the, the wall in the kitchen. But what happened was that it enabled me at the beginning of the game to be the center. And right after the tip off, revert to guard. And when the first whistle is blown, I probably come out of the game. But I got my block letter doing that all three years playing basketball. So when I tell people I was a center in a, on a basketball, they look at me and go, give me a break. And, uh, but uh, it, it's just something that you try to figure out what's, what's gonna get, allow you to get out there and be different and um, so that you might be recognized. He was the first mayor, Asian American mayor of a major American city, San Jose the first mainland Japanese-American in Congress, and therefore to chair a congressional committee. He was the first Asian-American in the cabinet. Before he was any of those things, his family was in a Japanese internment camp in World War II. He's got guts. Both of us have guts. Anybody can just fart around and do nothing. But he did something, and when 9-11 when, when came, he pulled 4,300 flights out of the air in seconds. Somebody said, well, how can you do that? You better check so-and-so. And I believe his phrase always is, you just do what's right. Right after 9-11, I was deeply concerned that our country would lose its way and treat people who may not worship like their neighbor uh, as non-citizens. So I went to a mosque. And in some ways, I, I, uh, Norm's example uh, inspired me. Whereas I didn't want our country to do to others what had happened to Norm. So it wasn't until later on, as an adult, that you keep reflecting on what happened to you. You know, you were really screwed. And that, you know, stays in the back of your mind. And you think, okay, at some point in life, you could do something to try to correct. So I've always tried to speak out for those who didn't have a voice in government or were underrepresented in terms of their own interests or their own uh, goals and aspirations. He was somebody who made a commitment to help APIAs in the political and, and community life and to get on with it and train people. It was an idea and he was the champion of that idea. Norm's ability to truly listen to people, to hear what they're saying, and there's a deep sense of Norm that wants to help people, uh, wants to help them, help whatever it is that they're trying to achieve. I think that that's what makes him effective. And he is also extremely accessible, always has been. Absolutely. Ah, and your? I didn't know they were going to name an airport after me. The mayor consulted with the city council, dropped in a resolution, the council passed it, and I was then notified by the mayor that it was now going to be the Norm, Norman Y. Mineta San Jose International Airport. So ever since then, I've been saying, isn't that strange? My parents named me after an airport. And even my grandkids one time said, Grandpa, do you own an airport? 
Norm is an amazing father. He's loving, he's caring. We have four wonderful sons that have married four wonderful women. They've given us 11 wonderful grandchildren. We're blessed. Now, the reason why Norm got selected is because of his service to our country. I wanted people to better understand the life of a kid who was put in, uh, interned uh, because of his uh, background, uh, who then went on to serve in, in a distinguished way in a variety of positions. And in each position, Norm was highly respected, not only because of his, the, the job he did, but because of his character. Norman Wymanette is a happy person. You can't go around life frowning, but you can have a positive feeling even if things aren't going that well around you. You can't get bogged down by the negativism of some uh, issue, and uh, you just have to keep working at it. And uh, I've been very, very fortunate in being able to, I think, keep an upbeat spirit and then be tenacious about getting the job done. <laughs>